Good morning, everyone. First world problems, right? We kvetch and kvetch. What are we kvetching about? It's worthwhile remembering. We started with 1917, and then we moved to 1947. Two seminal events that shaped Israeli discourse and the Zionist conversation. And today I'd like to turn to 1967. Micha on Sunday is going to frame 1967 in a larger conceptual manner. What I'd like to focus on is one of those features that 1967 changed, that changed Jewish history, changed Jewish self-understanding, and also created a brand new arena of challenges and responsibilities for the Jewish people. In 1967, the Jewish people once again are in control of their holiest site. Har Habayit Biyadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Now Jerusalem is a city that we mastered mourning about. We were great mourning its loss. We knew exactly what to do. We knew exactly what buttons to push, how it was supposed to shape us, what we were supposed to think about. The Jerusalem that we lost is a Jerusalem that unified Jewish history for 2,000 years. We loved saying L'Shana Habab Yerushalayim. We even had a cute tune. What happens, though, when, the, when instead of next year in Jerusalem, Har Habayit Biyadeinu, the Temple Mount, is in our hands. Can we handle it? Can we understand it? What does it mean? What does it mean to shift from having a city that you prayed for for so long, and now it's in your hands? Are you, why are you capable? Are you capable of handling it? I want to talk about the Jerusalems of the Jewish people. Because Jerusalem, in fact, is a profoundly divided city now that it's in our hands. When it wasn't in our hands, its loss was the overarching umbrella creating a unified Jerusalem. Paradoxically, it is the, unific it is the physical unification of Jerusalem which has created a profoundly divided city. Divided between our ideas, divided between our aspirations, divided between what we want to do with this city. And not only does it divide us, in fact, these various Jerusalems are in conflict with each other. Very often, they're incommensurate with each other. So I would like to dig deep into what does Jerusalem mean. And in today's session, I want to focus on six of the multiple meanings of Jerusalem, if we can. They are the Jerusalem of God, the Jerusalem of prayer, the Jerusalem of peoplehood, the Jerusalem of responsibility, the Jerusalem of loss, and the Jerusalem of hope. And I want to tell the story of 1967 and the story of Zionism, and in fact also part of the story of Jewish identity, because that story has been intimately connected through this idea of Jerusalem. When we talked about the world that we yearned for, we talked about it by talking about Jerusalem. When we talked about how we wanted to live, we talked about it through portraying what Jerusalem should look like. And so politically, we are all filled with the notion of Jerusalem as the undivided capital of the Jewish people for now and all eternity. You have to get, that's a mantra. Jerusalem is the undivided capital of the Jewish people for now and all eternity. If you can say that within three seconds, you're a traitor. <laughs> I once, truth, I was once here in this hall speaking to a group of 200 high school students. And we were talking about Jewish identity. And these are students who are majoring in Jewish studies in their high schools in the Be'eri program. And um, we were talking about what is it, is there any core to Judaism? And you know, Judaism, it's kind of hard. There is no core to Jew. We have no shahadat. It's, Judaism doesn't unite us. It divides us. It's almost impossible to find one feature of Judaism that everybody who calls themselves a Jew would agree upon. It's just about impossible. 
There's nothing that, that is nothing. If you're Jewish, you accept A, B, or C. That all Jews will agree upon, it's an interesting feature of Jewish life that we don't have such a thing. We don't have a Shaddat, there is no God but God and Muhammad is God's messenger, for example. There is no such thing. There's Jews who are atheists and Jews, the last thing, and, and Bible was written by J.E.P. and D. and not by Moses. And so we're so far from a Shahadat, it's unbelievable. So I asked, but we were talking about the issue, and I asked, is there anything that unifies? Is there anything that, that is the essence of Judaism? Yes. Jerusalem is the undivided capital of the Jewish people for now and all eternity. <laughs> it was like, well, this is, you know, it's, in Israel, you can't run. You can't be a viable politician. This unified city, this city. But in fact, as we know, it's not a unified city. It's a very, very divided city. And I want to talk about its, its ideological divisions, not its political divisions. One of the classic distinctions of Jerusalem, one that was developed when we weren't holding on to Jerusalem is the division between the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem. You cannot understand Jerusalem today unless you understand how irrelevant that distinction is. When you have a heavenly Jerusalem and an earthly Jerusalem, life is fine. The problem in Jerusalem is the two are squished together. It's actually once Har Habayit Biyadenu, once we return to Jerusalem, there is no longer a heavenly Jerusalem. It's here. Jerusalem is where the heavenly and the earthly are combined, and that is precisely why it is such a mess. If it was in heaven, life would be relatively simple. It's precisely because we don't know how to bring the two together how the two are supposed to live with each other, and how we are supposed to live as the sovereigns over a Jerusalem which is also the heavenly and also the earthly, that we have profound challenges. And that's the story I want to talk about. And I want to talk, start by talking about the Jerusalem of God. There's a great paradox in monotheism. Monotheism at its core espouses the idea not merely of a one God, but a God who's radically other. And that radical otherness essentially precludes the limiting of that God to a particular place, to a particular form, to a particular body. The oneness of God has within it an, a, an embedded principle of God's radical otherness, and by which I mean also God's transcendence. God is no longer, is no more here than God is there. Yet, every monotheist tradition, monotheistic tradition believes that Jerusalem is different. Every monotheistic tradition has a notion of holy space. Holy space at its core is antithetical to monotheism. Yet every one of us has it. Whether it's coherent or not, we'll leave for a theological discussion at a later time. For our purposes this morning, it's sufficient to recognize that our tradition takes very seriously the idea that there is a space which God resides in, more than others. Exodus 3, chapter 23. Three times, source seven, three times in the year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Deuteronomy 16. Three times in a year shall, I, shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, on the feast of the unleavened bread, on the feast of the weeks, and on the feast of the tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty empty-handed. One of the key commandments of our tradition is the commandment of yearly pilgrimage during Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. But what are you coming, why are you making a pilgrimage? You don't get to see, the term is not year, it's not that you get to see God, 
You come to be seen by God. Jerusalem is literally the place where you are seen by God. Because Jerusalem is a place where while God resides throughout the world, here God resides more thickly, more intensely. The holiness of Jerusalem is literal. Literal. And when Solomon builds his temple and consecrates the temple and speaks about it in Source 1, Kings 1, Chapter 8, then Solomon brought all the men of Israel gathered before King Solomon. Verse 9, there was nothing inside the ark but the two tablets of stone. Verse 10, when the priests came out of the sanctuary, for the cloud had filled the house of the Lord, and the priests were not able to remain and perform the service because of the cloud, for the presence of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is not an analogy. This is literal. It can't get more literal then. You couldn't be in the room because God's presence, the cloud, literally sucked the oxygen out of the room and you had to physically leave. So while we believe in a one God who has no form, who cannot be seen, who is the creator God of the universe, that creator God of the universe squishes God's self into the Temple Mount. And by squishing God's self into the Temple Mount, cr creates literally, or consumes the space in the most literal sense. And that's why when we want to see be seen by God, three times a year we go to Jerusalem. We don't think about Jerusalem. We don't turn around and say, Shalom Aleichem, God created the universe, you're here too. We don't turn to the godly within us. We literally go to the place that God inhabits. And one of the ideas of Jerusalem is that this is the place that God inhabits in a different way than every other place in the world. It's one of the reasons why people go crazy in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem syndrome is not an accident. What does it mean to be so close to divinity? What does it mean to be touched by it, to feel touched by it? This idea that God is here also explodes Christianity and Islam into holy wars over who's going to dominate. And the only reason why we didn't engage in that holy war is we were powerless. We might have, but we lost from the beginning, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a competition in the major leagues and we were in some bush league somewhere. But if you own Jerusalem, to be the master of Jerusalem is to be the master of God. To be the master of Jerusalem is a symbol that you are more loved by God than anybody else. The amount of blood spilled in order to claim that I am in control of God's house is, in, is immeasurable. Because one of the great fantasies of monotheism, which I do write about in my book, <laughs> by the way, and it's on, no. <laughs> it's not, it's not, is how monotheism creates the greatest idolatry. It's one of its greatest paradoxes that my monotheism is supposed, to create, is supposed to be the enemy of idolatry, but in fact activates this impulse in humankind to control God and in so doing creates the fantasy that you are the master of God. And the greatest idolatry which monotheism creates is the idolatry of humankind, where the human being yearns to master. God, if I could control, it's one thing I could control a minor little, a minor little idol. And as Yechezkel Kaufman says, the essence of idolatry in the Bible is not the worship of stones, it's not the worship of something physical, it's the worship of that over which you believe you can, uh, you can control. That ritual, uh, that ritual and magic are means to control divinity. At the end, 
It is the human which dictates what the divine will do. And that the essence of the monotheist idea is to accept into your life a deity who by definition has an independent will and who by definition is not controlled by you. That's the idea. But in fact, we are a resourceful creation. And even this idea of the one God, we yearn to control it. And one of the ways that we try to express it is who is the master of Jerusalem. But now, after 2,000 years, we're not merely mourning its loss. Har habayit biyadenu, the temple mount is in our hands. So does that now mean that we are the masters of God? Does it now mean that yes, God loves us, here it is, if you control Jerusalem, God loves you. One of the reasons why so many Israelis, so many, as most, almost every single Israeli Jew, is against the internationalizing of Jerusalem is that it is precisely relinquishing the claim to Jerusalem which somehow diminishes your legitimacy as a Jew. Now that I'm in control of Jerusalem, I won. I finally won. I am here. I am the new superpower. And we know how often in Christianity in the past there was no problem visiting Jews in Yad Vashem. There's no problem embracing Jews who suffered in the Holocaust. But can you embrace Jews who say the Temple Mount is in our hands? Because does that mean that you won? So now, is it our? We won! And if we internationalize it, then nobody, is, is this sort of saying nobody wins? Or after 2,000 years, we want to be able to say we won. But what does it mean to say we won? It is precisely through the idea of Jerusalem and through having, being able to say the Shana Habab Yerushalayim that messianic politics takes off in Israeli society far more than in 1948. While Rav Kook and religious Zionism speaks about Hatchalta Dagula, the beginning of the redemption, that Zionism, that the return of Jews to Israel is the beginning of a process, well, when you come to, once 67 comes, once we say Harabait Biadenu, once we are in control of the city of God, literally, it's not Hatchalta Dagula, the beginning of the messianic era. Now we are in the midst of the Messianic era. God has returned to Jewish history. God is now a player again in our history. And for 2,000 years, history was a problem for Jews. After 67, once we control the Temple Mount, history is no longer a problem. God is no longer the God whose face is hidden. God is no longer the God who expresses God's power through controlling God's will. God is now the God who is victorious for Israel. Look, har habayit biyadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. It redefines Israeli politics. Now, do we get to strut like Christianity and Islam? Do Jews get to strut? Because now we know God is on our side. If I have the Temple Mount is in my hands, then history is now defined. We now control history. What does it mean to be sovereign over the city of God? On the one hand, for many it means God loves me best. And you can't understand Israeli politics unless you understand that deep within Israeli consciousness post-67 is an experience of God loving me best. And this has very profound ramifications for what we think about in Judea and Samaria, what do we think about the, way of the status of non-Jews in Israel, and also our relationship with the world. Before 67 Jews, we're very humble. The sovereign over the Temple Mount challenges that humility. But at the same time, our tradition puts a twist to this idea. 
God is not only abiding in Jerusalem. And by the way, just open up a little window. I'm just, you know, on a computer, just click open a window a second. This is instead of a footnote. And just, just know this, because it's a worthwhile thing. Don't say it outside, because people aren't prepared for this. OK? But we'll just, it'll be just our secret. Jerusalem is not mentioned in the five books of Moses. Shh, those of you who couldn't hear, it's OK. <laughs> you're, not, you're not prepared. Because part of our strutting is, we care about Jerusalem more than Muslims because Jerusalem is not mentioned where? In the Quran. It's hinted to, but, but in our but we, Jerusalem's not mentioned. It's mentioned in the, in the prophets. But in the five books of Moses, it's not mentioned. All that's mentioned is go to the place where God will choose to place God's lemakom asher yifchar Hashem l'shachen shmo sham, the place where God will choose to have God's name reside there. Now, there's another place that God chose to reside in in the Bible. Do any of you know what that was? Before the Mishkan, Mount Sinai. There is another physical space which God is there. Let's please turn to source five. On the third day as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain. Moses led the people out of the camp towards God, literally toward God. These terms were not even, it's, they are so alien to a, a, mon, a modern monotheistic sensibility and sensitivity. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, verse 18, for the Lord had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. I'm not sure, but this is probably what happens when God goes down. Some of you recognize cynicism at 9.15 in the morning, 9.29. And the blare of the horn grew louder and louder, and Moses spoke. God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, literally. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And now comes something critical which has the potential to shape the way Jews think about the city of God. And we have a choice to make. Do we hear this or do we hear another voice? Because the voice of the Jewish legal tradition actually states, the Lord said to Moses, go down, warn the people not to break through to the Lord to gaze, lest many, lest many of them perish. Under Jewish law, the more God resides in a place, the less you are sovereign over that space. The fantasy of how of the Temple Mount is in your hands and that it literally means you're in control of the mountain of God in our tradition, it is the opposite. If God resides there, you're not allowed to be there. And under Jewish law in Source 6, you'll read it on your own, the more a place is holy, how is its holiness reflected? By creating standards whereby less and less people are allowed to go there. There are different standards and levels of impurity. The closer you come to the presence of God, the less individuals are allowed to be there until we get to the Holy of Holies, in which only, only the high priest and only on Yom Kippur this Moses moment is allowed to enter. And so here we come to a paradox of Jerusalem. A paradox when the heavenly and the earthly meet. If you are now, or you yearn, 
to be in control of the city of God. If you believe that it's the city of God, then it's never in your hands. And if it's in your hands, then it couldn't be the city of God. That God's presence requires of you to contract yourself and leave. As Yossi Klein Halevi in, in our Chevrut, in our I Engage Chevruta taught us, one of the most remarkable things that happens in the 1967 war, after capturing the Temple Mount, declaring Harabait Biadenu, putting up a big flag, everybody leaves the Temple Mount and goes to the Kotel to pray. They leave, the, they go to the Kotel to pray. You have to leave. Can we be the first sovereigns of Jerusalem who recognize that the Temple Mount is not in our hands? Precisely because this is the city of God. Can our religious consciousness and sensibility create the responsibility to contract your sovereignty? I don't mean the political sovereignty. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not talking whether Jerusalem should, that doesn't interest me today. That's, that's for political discourse for everybody to disagree upon and knock yourself out. I'm not talking about what we should, that the boundaries. But that deep down, to have the consciousness that it's, we're not in control of God because I want to tell you, when you believe you are, you unleash a dangerous force within your community. That fantasy that you control God enables you to ignore realpolitik. The fantasy that you control God unleashes a force which, which, which activates the destructive, the destructive dimension of chosenness instead of its positive dimension. Beware of wanting to be sovereign over the, over the city of God. Because then you, you morally, politically strut you lose the essential dimension of humility, which is critical for religious piety, and even more importantly, critical for moral responsibility. Because without that humility, you don't see others. Morality begins when you are able to see somebody else. When you see them, not to use Kantian terms, not as a means, but as an end, and as an end as that which obligates you, as an end which challenges you, as an end which should activate in you a responsibility to be of assistance. But if all you see is yourself when you look into the horizon and you never transcend your own belly button, the others don't exist and your ability to, to accept upon yourself moral responsibility is dramatically diminished. When you hold on to the city of God, you're tempted to be the master of God. And an Israel which believes, not physically, but psychologically, har habayit biyadeinu, we, we are the new Islam and Christianity. If we return to Jerusalem, if 1967 enables Jews to have that mentality, then we are going to be, and we are, profoundly, profoundly challenged both religiously, morally, and politically. So the idea, on the one hand, of Har Habayit Biadenu is powerful. Because for so long, we suffered from people saying, you're nothing. We're the ones who are the masters of Jerusalem. You're the ones who are the masters of the song. Next year in Jerusalem, knock yourself out. Your next year will never come. This year, we are the ones who've prevailed in Jerusalem. And we felt the degradation of that. And so on the one hand, by coming back to Jerusalem, we are now here again. We're here. We are players in world, in world history. We're no longer the stepchild of monotheistic faiths the pride, the dignity, were present. But how to be present, the, the, the line between presence, pride on the one hand, and arrogance on the other is this thin. And when you slip to arrogance, then you become idolatrous. 
Jerusalem as the city which enables you to experience God, and Jerusalem as the city which could be a catalyst for idolatry. That's the danger when the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem meet, and that's the Jerusalem which is right outside this Beit Midrash. The second Jerusalem is the Jerusalem of prayer. In what is probably the least known and most remarkable chapter in the Bible. It's not, there's more known chapters which might be more remarkable. This is the remarkable in relationship to its unknowedness. Is Kings 1, chapter 8, a part of which we just read. Please turn to source 9. Solomon just finishes building the temple, fulfills his father's dream to build a house for God. David wants to build. David says, I have a house. This is the, I want a house for you. And God says, OK, I didn't think about that. But if that's something that's, re you know what? I'll go for a house for me, but you can't build it. You don't get to build it. And in Divrei Yamim, it explains that David doesn't get to build it because your hands are filled with blood, are stained with blood. You don't get to build the house of God if you're a warrior king, which is another huge idea to speak about at another time. We'll come back to it. But you just, Solomon finishes this enterprise, consecrates the temple. We are told that the priests have to leave the room because the presence of the God fill, a presence of God fills the house. And now, right after that depiction, listen to what Solomon says. Then Solomon declared, the Lord has chosen to abide in a thick cloud, referencing the thick cloud which just fills the temple. I have now built for you a stately house, a place where you may dwell forever. Perfect. This is your home. And now look what Solomon says a few verses later. But will God really dwell on earth? Even the heavens to their uttermost reaches cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Solomon, the minute he completes the temple, recognizes that it's a facade. It's a facade. What are we talking about? A house of God? What God's going to recite here? Even the heavens don't contain you. Solomon completes his life's work and declares that the whole idea of a holy site is antithetical to monotheism. Now, this is one of the reasons why I love the Bible. Biblical critics see this as multiple authors fighting with each other. I see this as multiple ideas fighting with each other. Right when you finish building this temple, which can now become the source of idolatry, it's, it's just remarkable. We build it, you complete it, and now we say we've basically done nothing. Because look at this huge thing. I've spent hundreds of gazillions of I don't know what's for what. But this physical space is of any value? The heavens and the earth don't contain you. A house? So right over there, that temple mount, Solomon says, is meaningless from a perspective of, of holiness. Meaningless. God is no more present in Jerusalem than God is in Palo Alto. You want God? You don't have to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You want to be seen by God? What are you, nuts? You think you have to come here to be seen by God? And Solomon, at the moment of building the temple, basically pulls the rug out of the whole idea of holy space, or the, the literal reading of holy space. Now, to be part of a tradition where in the same chapter these two opposite ideas are there is just remarkable. Now, my whole approach to, the, to, to all of these contradictions is that the greatness of the Bible is that it is the foundation of the destruction of the idea of Judaism and produces the idea of Judaisms. There is no Judaism. There's Judaisms. 
and they live and they contradict and they're in there and they compete and different people read the same chapter and notice different verses. A, a religious tradition that speaks this way is a religious tradition that has a tremendous amount of air for different people to find themselves. And you could see it right here, verse after verse, a complete reversal. It's a remarkable, remarkable idea. People think that the idea of debate is a rabbinic tradition. Yisrael Knoll, the, the, the premier Bible scholar of the Mahon, is the one who taught us that that rabbinic tradition was founded in biblical literature, if you know how to look. And he taught us. He gave us the eyes. So then what? If this whole idea is nothing, then what are you doing here? Then, okay, here I understand. Hartman Institute. <laughs> no, I can understand. We're not claiming to be holy. That's why we have to give you good food. Like, we're competing. It's like, like we got to compete here. But what are you, what's, why is everybody going crazy of Jerusalem? Solomon shifts Jerusalem from being the city of God to being the city of prayer. In so doing, frees us from idolatry and unleashes a new danger. So if you're not here, Solomon says, could you just do me a favor? Yet turn, O Lord my God, to the prayer and supplication of your servant, and hear the cry and prayer which your servant offers before you this day. I who built you this fake home which you're not going to live in, could you please do me a favor now and listen? May your eyes be open day and night towards this house, towards the place in which you have said my name shall abide there. May you heed the prayers which your servant will offer towards this place. And when you hear the supplications which your servant and your people Israel offer towards this place, give heed in your heavenly abode, give heed and pardon. Jerusalem is not where God lives. The holiness of Jerusalem is because it is a functional holiness and it is the place in which we believe if we direct our prayers here, the God who doesn't reside here will nevertheless hear that which is directed to this city. Jerusalem is not where God lives. Jerusalem is a gateway to God. It's a gateway for prayer. Now, it didn't need to be. The monotheistic God doesn't need a gateway. Who needs a gateway? We need a gateway. Because the reality is, is that monotheism is an idea that really doesn't suit the human temperament. It's a great idea, but it's just too hard. A God who's independent is a great idea, but I want a God who I can control a little bit. Because if I actually need God, God's independence is not a great virtue. And a God who transcends space is a wonderful idea. But where do I meet that God when I need that God? And don't tell me, yeah, God answered and God said no. That doesn't really get you through the day. It can get you from time to time. But for 2,000 years, you're going to live as a Jobian person? Job is a moment. Job who suffers and says, God, I don't understand. You transcend my understanding. Great. You can't have a notion of monotheism without accepting that God's will by de that the idea of God by definition will transcend some of your understanding. I'm okay with that. But every day, always, you can't live in a Jobian consciousness forever. And one of the great remarkable creations of Judaism was how we were able to live in a Jobian reality without becoming Jobian. And that's a source for a whole other lecture. How did Judaism live in the experience of Job while not accepting the Jobian answer despite the fact that history defined or was only explained within the context of Job? But that is, again, it's a, it's a remarkable story. But it is through Jerusalem that I don't have an unknowable God. It is through Jerusalem that I feel that my prayers are going to be answered. That I feel more confident. Jerusalem gives to the religious soul the confidence that he or she will be heard. 
That is the essence of the city of the Jerusalem of prayer. And you make pilgrimage here for some to be seen by God, and for others you make pilgrimage to be heard. And I remember one of the smartest things I ever did as a rabbi, when I was a rabbi, and I made many, many mistakes as a rabbi. Most of the mistakes that I made was by, were by being honest. When, I, when someone asked rabbi and I asked me a question, I actually told them what I thought. <laughs> no, it, it was a major, major flaw and I was too young. I actually thought that people wanted to know what I thought and I didn't understand that when people asked me a question, I had to answer in ways that responded to what they needed to hear. And when I was younger, I didn't know that. So I told them. And I remember, I, it was, I was still young, but I, I just, I had, made, I had moved back to Israel in 95, and a congregant, someone who was in the JCC where I worked as a rabbi, calls me in a deep, deep panic. She's about to go into serious surgery, and she discovered that she doesn't have a Jewish name. And she wants to be prayed. She wants a tefillah, someone to pray, Misha Berach for her, but it won't work if you don't have a Hebrew name. So I could have told her, oh, you don't need a prayer, God knows. <laughs> That's what I, you know, no, yes, I understand. Now I was understanding. I was like a little, you know, like, there were moments of maturity in my life from time to time. <laughs> One of the nice things about grandchildren is it gives avenues for you, for your immaturity, right? So I could be like now immature. Um, so, but in any event, so I say yes. So I, she says, and the problem was, unfortunately, she wasn't in your congregations. She says, and I went to a rabbi, and I asked him if he could please give me a name, and he said, I can't, you're not my congregant. <laughs> now, we could laugh about it. We could laugh because we could imagine it, couldn't we? <laughs> it's imaginable, that's why it's such a horrific story. So I had this moment of revelation, a moment. And I said, when's your surgery? Tomorrow. I said, let's give you now a Jewish name. And I'm going to write it on a piece of paper. And I'm going to take it to the Kotel. And I'm going to place it in the Kotel before your surgery. From 6,000 miles away, you felt this this sigh of comfort. Now, I had an interesting dilemma. Do I go or not? <laughs> it was like, like, what do I do? <laughs> like, do you, do you not? It's an interesting question. Like, what do you do? I didn't have a doubt in my mind. You see, I don't like the Kotel. This is, doesn't do things for me. I'm not telling you not to like the Kotel at the Hartman Institute. We're very sensitive to other people's feelings. I'm just sharing my feelings. <laughs> my feelings, it's, it's just not the shul I would ever want to go to. When I go to shul, I'm eternally grateful to my sister Tova for starting Shira Chadasha. That's a shul that fits well within my soul. And again, I'm not saying that's the shul you have to go to, but I'm saying I'm, that's, she did a great chesed to me personally and to my soul by creating that possibility, which I would have never created. Um, and, and she had the idea and created it. The Kotel's not a place which is for me. I took a taxi. <laughs> it was the weirdest feeling. I'm taking a taxi. I told him to wait. I walk up to the Kotel, put the piece of paper and leave and go back home. And I had this, out. I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I felt I was doing the right thing. <laughs> and I still don't know why. But I know that Jerusalem is where and a vehicle and a gateway through which you feel that you are heard. And that's the second idea of Jerusalem. But as distinct from the Jerusalem of God, where you yearn to control God, in the Jerusalem of prayer, it unleashes the fantasy that you will control who will be heard by God. You cannot understand the debate in the Jewish world today, or in Israel, about the third section of the Kotel, unless you understand the idea of the Jerusalem of prayer. 
what do you care if there's a third kotel? Like, let's, let me tell you the story. There was a kotel. That kotel was a very small little kotel. It was a kotel in which there was no mechitza. Men and women prayed next to each other. And for much of Jewish history, we weren't even allowed to pray there. After 67, Har Habayit Biyadenu, we, we create a big plaza, we, we discover, we now, what is, we have a big kotel now. Not a little pishy kotel, we have a big kotel. Still not as nice as the Temple Mount, not even close, frankly, but it's like, no, it's not even in the ballpark, but we have a nice kotel. And now we have a men's section and we have a women's section. But most Jews in the world, and precisely those outside of Israel, don't want to go to the men's section or the women's section. They want another kotel. Or women who want to read Torah or to, don't want, don't want, they don't have space in, in, the, in, the, in that kotel. Now we have a dilemma. We have limited resources. We stretch the kotel, but now this is the kotel. And, and a large segment of the Jewish world doesn't have a place in the Kotel. Magic. The Supreme Court in 2003, and then ultimately Sharansky most recently, we make a new discovery. There's more Kotel. <laughs> you thought that was the Kotel. No, that's not the Kotel. There's more Kotel. Now, that's perfect. That is a perfect idea. This will create the classic win-win. Who's going to lose? There's more Kotel. You could go along and say, it's not the Kotel. It's great. You won't go there because it's not the real Kotel. This is, the, I have the real Kotel. Wonderful. I have no problem if you believe you have the real Kotel as long as I have my Kotel. This is a perfect win-win. Nobody loses. Actually, women who want egalitarian services or who want to act in a different way at the Kotel have their own Kotel. People who want a, men and women to pray together could pray. To, everybody wins. Not only does everybody get their Kotel, but everybody has their Kotel in which the other doesn't come to. No, 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 it's not a joke. I'm talking conceptually. You're not bothering me. This is the ideal win-win. No, like in Israel, and you know this, I've taught for those of you who are to return, you know that in Hebrew there's a word for zero sum game. Mishak schum efes. There is no word in Hebrew for win win. No word. In Hebrew, when you want to say win win, you say vin vin. <laughs> That's Hebrew for win win. For in truth, it's vin vin. Vin vin. So this was going to be a vin vin. This was perfect. There'll be this kotel, and now there's a new kotel. Why would anybody disagree with this? Why would anybody disagree? And Netanyahu and Sharansky try to push through this idea. It's a win-win. Everybody wins. The problem, you know where the problem now is? Is there going to be one security gate? See, because what defines the Kotel? Not the wall. If the security plaza to the Kotel is shared, that means if I let you go through the same security gate to get to the Kotel, that means what I think is not the Kotel is I am giving you legitimacy by calling your Kotel part of the Kotel because you're going through the same security gate. What you're laughing about is my country. <laughs> That's the fight right now. And whether we're going to have a shared promenade where you come into the Kotel and then you have choices, or we need to make sure that the access to the non-Kotel has a Murano feel about it. It doesn't have the same security. You go around and you have to climb down this rickety wooden little thing and it's fakakt. <laughs> if it looks that way, it's like basically what I want. I want your kotel to look like the old kotel before we have the big kotel. Now, what is the battle about? Why isn't it a win-win? Because in the Jerusalem of prayer, 
Jerusalem is the gateway through which your voice is heard. And now we want to control whose voice is heard. And if, if Har Habayit Biyadenu, the Temple Mount is in my hands, now it's not that I have to control God. I can't control God. And it's interesting, most, the more religious you are, or the more observant you are in certain spheres in our community, the less you go up to the Temple Mount. The less you go there. I have no fantasy of controlling God. But I want my voice, I want my voice to be heard. And I also want your voice not to be heard. Because Israel unleashes the fantasy that I now have the power to determine who is the authentic Jew. I don't even want that you believe that your voice is heard is a problem for me. On the flip side, on another dimension, this is one of the reasons why the majority of Israelis also don't understand why Jews can't pray in the Temple Mount. Now, I personally, I told you that whole space doesn't do stuff for me. But I understand. If Jerusalem is the place where your voice is heard, if the Temple Mount is in our hands, I don't want to deny Islam its place. But that a Jew can't pray there? I understand for 2,000 years you were able to do that to me. But now it's in my hands. I remember I was a guest of the Waqf in, a, in our theology conference where we were invited, where Jews, Christians, and Muslims were invited to go up into the Temple Mount. And I remember going up with my kippah, and I had two people standing at my side for three hours, not moving an inch. Less for one second, I mumble something. <laughs> because if I prayed, then somehow they, I was taking up their channel. The Jerusalem of prayer could be a profoundly, profoundly disgusting Jerusalem. Why could the Temple Mount not be similar to what we do in Hebron? Conceptually, again, I don't relate to these ideas of holy space, but conceptually, it's incoherent. And we have to recognize that it's incoherent. So we make a decision not to fight that fight, and maybe that was the smart decision to make. But if we talk about the world that we live in, the same ugliness that doesn't allow a third kotel, the kotel of the Jewish people, is the same ugliness that doesn't allow a Jew to go on the Temple Mount and pray. It's the same, it's the same small theological instinct. It's the same small theological perspective as if the channel and the gateway to God is a very limited channel and if too many people are on it, the clutter will somehow slow down. You know, it's like there's too many people on your Wi-Fi or something. A heavenly Jerusalem is infinite. It's when the heavenly Jerusalem is down here, when the Temple Mount is in your hands, it's that it activates a smallness in the spiritual soul. And instead of expanding it, it shrinks us into being very small and frankly, aesthetically repulsive religious people. And again, what type of, what are we gonna do now that the Temple Mount is in our hands? And that's why I believe that one of the greatest expressions of the Temple Mount is in our hands is to stretch the Kotel. It's not worth it, but the ultimate expression of heaven is, of course, Jews could pray there too. Why not? Why not? What, are we, what is our notion of God? How monotheists have such a small notion of God is always source, being a source of profound, profound com, um, complexity to me. The Jerusalem of prayer. Oy. <laughs> I'm just working something out for a moment. Officially, we're not going to do all six today. <laughs> we'll do whatever we'll do, and we'll do it fine. I did start 10 minutes late. I just found another 10 minutes. Because I want to leave. I'm going to finish in 10 and leave a half hour for questions. 
There is a Jerusalem, I just want to mention it. There is a Jerusalem of peoplehood, which creates a completely different religious instinct than the Jerusalem of God or the Jerusalem of prayer. The Jerusalem of peoplehood is the Jerusalem that we were able to connect to very much when we didn't have Jerusalem. Jerusalem which we could unite in was not the Jerusalem where we, which we actually inhabited. Jerusalem was the place where you did not come to meet God. Jerusalem was not the place which was the gateway to your prayers. Jerusalem was the place where you came to meet fellow Jews. It was that which the Jewish people shared together. It was the one thing that we all had, and it doesn't matter where you were, and it doesn't matter in which corner of the universe you live in, as our tradition teaches us. If you lived in the north, you prayed to the south. If you lived live in the south, you prayed to the north. If you lived in the east, you prayed to the west. And if you lived in the west, you prayed to the east. And as the Tosefta says, and it comes out that all Jewish people will pray towards one place. That idea. And we don't just send our words to the gateway. We actually turn. And it is precisely through the Jerusalem of God and the Jerusalem of prayer that we see each other. <coughs> now, our rabbinic tradition in Source 11 tells of one of the great miracles. Ten miracles were performed for our forefathers in the Holy Temple. No man ever said to his fellow, my lodging in Jerusalem is too cramped for me. I don't believe that this was true. Actually, I know it wasn't true. I know the only time Jerusalem wasn't cramped was when we were in here. We, Jerusalem could be the capital of the Jewish people throughout the world as long as the Temple Mount wasn't in our hands. Because you direct your prayer, I direct my prayer, where it's easy. It's, it's easy to have a win-win because I don't even see you. In theory, I see you. In theory, Jerusalem is the unifying capital of the Jewish people because everybody claims it, but nobody has to compete for it. Because what direction you put your synagogue, you put the Aaron Kodesh in your synagogue, just doesn't, doesn't even interest me. I don't even think your shul's a shul. So I'd knock yourself out. But Jews could converge. Nobody was squished out of Jerusalem as long as we didn't have Jerusalem. But now that we have it, now that the Temple Mount is in our hands, the Jerusalem of peoplehood, the idea that the Jewish people need a capital, that idea, that idea that there's something that belongs to every Jew by definition, that's part of the way you create a people. We don't have a shared language anymore. And I, you know that bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah doesn't create Hebrew competency. We don't have a shared language. Is there something that we could share? We were able to share Jerusalem as long as we didn't have it. Now that we have it, Jerusalem is precisely that which embodies the disintegration of Jewish unity. What does it mean to, to be responsible for the, Jew, for the Jerusalem of peoplehood? Lurianic Kabbalah, and this is the only thing about Kabbalah that I know, um, speaks about how the infinite God allows or can enable the world to exist. If God's infinite, there's no space for the world. And Lurianic Kabbalah introduces the idea of tzimtzum, how God contracts God's self in order to enable the world to exist. The Jerusalem of peoplehood requires of us to contract ourselves. It requires not of God, but of us to contract ourselves because the idea that nobody in Jerusalem said, I don't have no room, was not a descriptive statement. It's a prescriptive responsibility. But unfortunately, the Jerusalem of God and the Jerusalem of prayer work opposite, have an opposite pull to the Jerusalem of peoplehood. And right now, the story of Jerusalem in the next 10 years is going to be which Jerusalem wins? The Jerusalem of peoplehood or the Jerusalem of prayer? And in many ways, the ability of world Jewry to have a relationship with Israel is going to depend on what happens, which Jerusalem wins. Because I'm of the belief, and, I, and it's, it is a belief, 
Maybe it's a prayer itself. I don't know how we're going to sustain universe, a Jewish peoplehood worldwide, but I know we don't have a chance if Israel doesn't embody and is not a beacon of core values and ideas that Jews around the world would feel proud to identify with. They still might turn away from it, but if we don't represent something of value, why would you want to have a connection to it? Jerusalem is a place where a new voice could come forth, a voice of pluralism, a voice of tolerance, a voice of moral excellence. That is a Jerusalem of peoplehood. To be a capital means that Jerusalem has to be epitome of something. That means, just like the Jerusalem of God, just like it is not the city of God if you are sovereign over it, and if you're sovereign over it, it's not the city of God. Or if it's the city of God, you can't be sovereign over it. The Jerusalem of people, it means that no single one of us can be sovereign over Jerusalem. It requires of us a different mindset. Whether we're going to have that mindset is a great, great challenge, the answer to which we do not yet know. I want to end with one last Jerusalem. And there's others, but I just don't have the time to. There's one that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Please turn to page 10, source 17. The famous song of Jerusalem by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat, sat and wept as we thought of Zion. Jerusalem, one of its deepest imprints on our soul is as, this, as the Jerusalem of loss. Jerusalem was the carrier of our pain. Jerusalem was that which epitomized the reality that we lost now that we're sitting by the rivers of Babylon. Jerusalem symbolized Jewish sovereignty, symbolized Jewish power for all the reasons that I mentioned before and including the Jerusalem of God. Jerusalem meant, if you were in control of Jerusalem, it meant that you were home. Jerusalem is, is, was, the, was the city whose, whose loss we felt as we experienced the humiliation and degradation of 2,2500 years of exile. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, sat and wept as we thought of Zion. There on the poplars, we hung up our lyres. For our captors asked us there for songs, our, tor our tormentors for amusement. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Amuse me. Oh, you powerless fools. Sing me one of your Jerusalem songs. You have lots of songs to Jerusalem. Exile was not just homelessness, it was degradation. It was humiliation. The only thing we could do, we couldn't fight. We couldn't get back to Jerusalem. The only thing we could do was to respond to ourselves how can we sing a song of the Lord on alien soil? The only option we had was silence. They taunted us, and all we could do was remain silent. And to ourselves, and in our own settings, and in our own simchas, say, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue stick to my palate if I cease to think of you. If I do not keep Jerusalem in the memory, even in my memory, even at my happiest hour. That's all we had. And so Jerusalem was always, was the city that we lost, was life as it should have been, as it could have been. It's life which is not what the life that we're living now. And this is where most people go on to another chapter. But you're not most people. And this is not most places. It is precisely the city of Jerusalem as the city of loss that we have to understand what it can unfold. 
Let's read to the end of the psalm, which most Jews don't know. Right after, Mazel Tov. You know, now the cup is broken, Mazel Tov. Psalm had more things to say. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they cried, strip her, strip her to her very foundations. Fair Babylon, you predator, a blessing on him who repays you in kind for what you have inflicted on us, a blessing on him who seizes your babies and dashes them against the rocks. You didn't know that, did you? Because we're Mazel Tov. Har Habayit Biyadeinu. All of Israel is challenged by one question. Now that we're back, what does 2,000 years of loss do to us? Does it become yesterday's story that we might remember? Does it become, let's remember our loss, remember you were strangers in the land of Egypt? Is that what we remember for 2,000 years? Or does the pain and the degradation so define us that we want vengeance? Blessing on him who sees your babies and dashes them against the rocks. Does anybody know where that comes from? Echa. Lamentations. When you read the detailed story of Jerusalem, this is what happened. This is what we did. This is what the Babylonians made us do. We had to, they took our babies. Um, a lamentation speaks about families having to cook their babies for food. That's in our lamentations. There's great advantages to not understanding Hebrew. <laughs> and not changing your liturgy. It's really good praying in Hebrew. It's, a, it's much sweeter. And then we become masters at all the other prayers of other religious traditions which somehow don't meet what we think they are. How could you pray for this? What does loss do to you? When har habayit biyadeinu, do you free yourself from that loss? Do you free yourself from your pain? and you become a new healthy people who is committed to living in the future in a way that, that learns from your loss and creates new responsibilities? Or is the loss so vital, so heavy on your soul, that all you can think about is vengeance? Does the loss define your consciousness to the extent that non-Jewish lives just don't matter anymore. It's coherent. To think that it's not coherent, not only is it coherent, it's human. Are we asking of Israelis to be superhuman? Are we asking of them to forget their loss, to forget the pain, to forget the terror, and to still act like this, this noble human being? Jerusalem is where that question is defined. Har habayit biadeinu, and with this I want to conclude. The Temple Mount is in our hands. When Motagor says this on the third day, it's as if an electrical jolt is transmitted throughout Jewish life. It touches Jews all over the world. Sharansky speaks about the fact how everything Everything changed for Soviet Jewry after the Temple Mount is in our hands. And he said, I didn't even know what the Temple Mount was. I just knew it's now in our hands, and that's a good thing. <laughs> no, he writes this literally. He says, I don't know what a Temple Mount was. But all of a sudden, because it's in our hands, people are looking at us differently. There's still anti-Semitism, but you're not the same Jew anymore. You're not the same Jew. Temple Mount is in your hands. It's a moment of pride. It's a moment of spiritual validation, which we Jews needed. You can't be, as I said, for perpetually the suffering Jew and still believe 
that there's a value to perpetuating who you are. Victory has to be part of your history. And the fact that we didn't have it for 2,000 years was almost incoherent and made it almost impossible to perpetuate Jewish life. The victory of 67, Temple Mount is in our hands, enables Jews to be Jews of pride, enables Jews to stand up, enables every one of you in this room to have a completely different identity, whether in Israel, whether in North America, whether in the former Soviet Union. I'm proud of a proud, powerful people. I have come home. The Temple Mount is in our hands. And 50 years later, we have to decide whether that's a blessing or a curse. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have time for about, now, could I just ask, because I know this was introduced, they told you about the two or three hand rule? Was that mentioned? Oh, I have something to tell you. We have 170 plus people. There are eight plenary sessions, or 10 plenary sessions. If you raised your hand more than twice, there's probably somebody else who doesn't get to ask. There's also some people who are quick handwrite, who have quick draws, and some are slower draws. By the way, that is very often a gender division. It's very often a gender division. And when there's a competition, very often, ah, OK, he really needs to ask a question. Let him ask the question. So I'm asking, I want to take questions, but I see two hands, and I'm going to take the two of you first, OK? Afterwards, just space your hand raisings to make part of making sure that in Jerusalem there's room for everybody, OK? So we're going to start with the two of you, and then we'll ask. And now I've intimidated everybody. Nobody's going to ask a question. Yes, please, sir. No, no, you. Yes. Yes, please. And then. Oh, OK. Yes, please. Either one. Yes, please. If the first premise is that it's a Jerusalem of God, how, it's a simple question. How have we corrupted it so that we've let ourselves take over that sovereignty? If it really is God who, quote unquote, owns Jerusalem, then it's a Jerusalem of all people and all the models that you've set forth, well, brilliant, go away. Because that's my simplistic question. No, it's not. I love simplistic questions. Because um, it's a very, very deep question. And I didn't have the time. But when you read Isaiah 2, under the Jerusalem of hope, Isaiah says, what does it really mean for Jerusalem to be the Jerusalem of God? It becomes a city which all peoples of the world come to. It be, you know, Torah <laughs> We think Torah, we nonprofits in Jerusalem, we think our Torah comes out of Jerusalem to you. It's a nice verse. It's nice having a verse which justifies our existence. Torah, a Torah will come forth from Zion, is not the Torah of Sinai. The Torah of Zion is a new Torah, it's a universal Torah, which, in which we finally understand what it means to live with a universal God. And then it is a Torah of justice, a Torah in which swords are turned into plowshares. That's the, the Torah of Zion is not Shabbos and Kashrus. It's a universal Torah. Now, how do we do that? How do we, again, I'm not just, I'm, again, my politics are, I'm, I'm not for universalizing Jerusalem. It's, it's not, but it's, it's not the political conversation. It's the psychological understanding that you're in control of something that's bigger than you, and therefore you're not really in control of it. Human beings have great difficulty with that. It's, it's almost too much for us. And that's why when the two Jerusalems come together, our minds blow, and sometimes it, it it evolves into the worst of us instead of creating or activating the best of us. But Isaiah 2 pushes, pushes something and says, um, if you really want to be the master of Jerusalem, you have, to, you have to understand what it is that we really yearn for. Yes, please, sir. Um, there's more than one opposite to our Habayi, when they, when they, uh, I didn't hear your first word, please. There's more? It seems like there's um, more than one opposite. Opposite. To when they took down the Israeli flag from the 
go a little wrong. One could interpret that in different ways. The, the uh, sovereignty of God is one way, but that wasn't what was implemented. And we got a situation where, where people brought on dump trucks and hollowed out areas of the Temple Mountain and dumped it in the, in the valley. And in previous, uh, during the Christian occupation, they, they cut pieces of the foundation stone and they sold them as a fundraiser. Uh, so what's, what would be a concrete way to try to implement the concept that you're talking about, the sovereignty of God? First, you're absolutely correct that on the one hand, har habayit be adenu, and on the other hand, it's not. Because the reality is Jews can't pray there. The reality is that the waqf could take 2,000 years of Jewish archaeological stuff and dump it in a garbage pail. And we remain silent. The reality is, and this is, this, it's a great tension. You could see the tension of modern Israel. Because on the one hand, if Har Habayit be a day, new God's on our side, does that mean now we could forget about realpolitik or not? And there's a line in Israeli society, to what extent realpolitik applies to us and to what extent it does not. Do we function on a different realm or not? And it's interesting, for most Israelis, for most Israeli politicians, starting with Dayan with his famous declaration immediately afterwards and when we take down the flag, is we decide that with all the victory of 67, we're still not sure, and therefore we're going to work with the realpolitik. While a very strong force within the religious Zionist movement felt that post-67, we don't need to be worried about realpolitik anymore. Um, what does, and you'll come next, what does, how would a, uh, um, a recognition that this is the city of God represent itself? depends on your theology, but the God that I want to worship is a God that you can only worship to the extent that humility defines your religious soul. When somebody is not humble according to the Talmud, God says to that person, you and I can't live in the same world. To live with God is to accept an infinite that's greater than you. Now what does it mean to be a humble sovereign over Jerusalem? It means to share it. It means to advocate for the space of others. It means if you believe, and I'm making this as the if, if you believe that peace is possible. If you don't believe that peace is possible, it's another story. If you believe that peace is possible, what's wrong with, with physically dividing? What's wrong with allowing others to feel that they have a place here too? It is precisely because it is the city of God that I don't have to be the sole master of it. I'm not saying where it would be divided and how and politically and where you would put the, I'm not talking, I'm just talking conceptually. As a city of God, it has to require of you to contrast, contract yourself. But also, most importantly, as the city of God, as Psalm 15 says, if this really is a city of God, who may sojourn in your tent who may dwell on your holy mountain? He who lives without blame, he who does what is right, in his heart acknowledges the truth, whose tongue is not given to evil, who has never, who has never done harm to his fellow or borne reproach, reproach for his acts towards his neighbor. The city of God is not a feather in your, in your pantheon of chosenness. The city of God is a huge responsibility. If you want to be sovereign of the city of God, it's not, through your, it's not through your might and your ability to constrain others, but it's actually, actually in your ability to compromise, in your notion that Jerusalem has to be a place where a voice of moral responsibility to others is paramount. Jerusalem has to be a place that pushes us to be more. Heschel speaks about this beautifully in his Echo of Eternity. Jerusalem is, I push it. If Jerusalem is just, it's, just, it's this, I won, I got it. It's a, is Jerusalem a prize? A city of God has to be more than that. But that's not political. That's 
it's a different spiritual move, which I hope will one day come to this city. Right now, however, our theology is very different, and that theology is leading to a very, very different politics. I hope that was sufficient. I think your hand in the back, yes, sir, and then, yes, sir, and then I'm just looking. I'm looking for someone who doesn't start with a sir. Um, yes, ma'am. So we have sir, sir, ma'am, and then we're going to, we won't, well, then we'll, okay? okay? Yes, please. In Psalm 137, when talking about verses 6, six through 9, you said that this is what the Babylonians made us do. No. You said, yeah, you said that. No. This is what the Babylonians did to us. Um, I think, well, just taking the concept of the, this is what the, like, the Babylonians did to us and then what we did to other people, could you see or do you see, what do you think of 67 being what the Nazis made us do? Explain a little more because I don't want to answer the question that I that that I'm not sure I was asked. So I was deeply disturbed when I read this for the first time. Yes. And I become disturbed when I read some of the things that came out of the sixty seven war. Yeah. Um, and I think that the Babylonians did to us what the Nazis did to us. And I was thinking that the Okay, fair enough. Yes. I'm going to repeat, and if I don't repeat it accurately, stop me before I answer, okay? In yesterday's lecture, we heard that Jews did not take revenge on Nazis, and that part of the 1947 experience was the willingness of the Jews to enter back into history, that we were again going to work in the community of nations instead of walking away, and I imagine you also read the Elie Wiesel, that, that piece that we did not. But your name, please, sir? Josh. Josh is acting, asking, maybe we didn't take revenge against the Nazis, but did we, in our return to Israel, legitimize taking revenge against other peoples? Did I, and that's connected with, I was very upset by the last verses that we just read here as evidence to that possibility or to the place of that revenge, that, uh, that revenge being plausible and having a place both within our tradition and possibly within our, um, our political life. Is that a fair representation? Okay. First, I want to open up a window. Okay, I want to use this as a moment for reflection before I get directly to what you were talking about. There is a, there was a gasp in the room for a moment when you mentioned Nazi. Now, we have a very inconsistent, complex relationship to using these analogies. On the one hand, it's perfectly legitimate to associate non-Nazi enemies to Nazis. In other words, Nazis are in a sui generis. We could call Iran Nazi, we could call Hezbollah Nazi, Hamas Nazi, terrorist Nazi, Islam Nazi. We are very comfortable with a, a fam using a Wittgensteinian family resemblance to the Nazi category for a whole group of people. And that is widely, no one ever gets up and says, you are defaming the, cat the Holocaust by saying Khomeini is a Nazi. Because someone could say, did Khomeini, which, what, again, I'm not saying Khomeini is a sweet man, I'm not saying he's a sweetie pie, but there is this notion of, of the Nazi being this unique epitome of evil which is incomparable, but we're very comfortable comparing it and using it very loosely in one direction. The flip side is that our community Fought, before we even get to be able to think about the question you asked, very often get turned off from the question itself by the mere possibility that you were maybe associating some things that Israel is doing with Nazis. That mere association itself 
shuts down the soul, the conversation, the discourse. How dare you compare us to Nazis? If you compare us to Nazis, you're any, the, I can't even. So what happens is, is that we become strict, what's the word? Strict, some, strict constructionists in the, in the use of the category in one direction while allowing profound looseness in the other category. I am going to interpret your question with the same latitude that I believe we have to allow to both sides. I do not believe that you were saying that we were as bad as Nazis. That's not what you were saying. And you weren't saying, okay, where are our concentration camps? If we, didn't have con if we, were, if we don't have a war of extermination, this, by the way, in our intergenerational conversation, one of the things that shuts it down, we heard the word, some people hear the word apartheid. We get into, now all of a sudden we become legal scholars and we give you the 15 classical definitions of apartheid without understanding we're not, we're using terms differently. We're using terms which epitomize, epitomize for us a certain sense of evil and we're associating it without claiming that there's a direct correlation between the two. The challenge is, is that certain categories also don't allow, not for complex arguments, for complex feelings. Because I, for example, and again, this is just Daniil Hartman for whatever it's, I make no idolization of what Israel is. But Israel has my loyalty. If, I, if, I, if the category of Nazi was something that I would associate, I, could, I would feel morally, it, I, I, would be in a, I couldn't make that yes but place. Now it's perfect for Siligin and for someone to say, maybe that's precisely the problem. Maybe you're allowing something which you shouldn't be allowing. But I find that, the degra that there's a gradation in moral challenges which also allow for a complexity and variety of responses. Which, which I feel is relevant in our discussion. It's relevant in Israeli politics, and I, I want to find a way to be able to talk about it. I'm not sure I can, but I feel it's relevant, because I don't feel it's a, it's, it's not that there isn't moral failure, but I feel that the categorization of blame, complexity, requires and gives me room to still fight from the inside instead of being the critic from the outside. And that's why some of the categories and the use of categories is very, very important in enabling that. I was being kind of subtle and I hope that was understood. But now I want to deal with your question. Because your question is a very tough question. I would say without doubt, whether it's the Holocaust, and I will speak more post-Second Intifada. I don't know if it was the Holocaust itself. Um, by and large, the Jewish people post-Holocaust embraced what Ilana, I believe, spoke about. We left the Holocaust, and in a remarkable act of spiritual courage, we're still willing to re-engage with the world. Maybe the lack of vengeance was made possible by the fact that we were still frightened and still relatively powerless. And so whether that was a reflection of heightened moral sensibility or heightened moral sensibility supported by realpolitik, I don't know. There is no doubt that the reality of Israel makes possible for Jews to do more harm to others than we ever had in Jewish history. It makes possible. We didn't have that potential before. Post-67, the awesomeness of that victory the remarkable nature of it gives to Jews power, which is we become Jews of power, a sentence that couldn't be associated with Jews. As Jews of power, the power means that you have the ability to defend yourself, but power means also that you can harm others. And there is no doubt that the more you feel attacked, the more you feel somebody wants you dead, the harder it is to feel morally responsible for them. And part of what's been happening in Israel, and we're working really hard to try to combat this, 
Nothing to do with security. When it comes to security, nobody, you have a moral responsibility to defend yourself. I have no qualms about that. But one, and I have no problem with political debates about what Israel should do right now. Does Abu Mazen want peace? Does he not want peace? Of course you could debate that. Is Hamas, could Hamas take over if you sign a deal or not? Of course that's debatable. How do you live in the midst of an Arab world without one single functioning country which is not a dictatorship? These are all political realities that could activate different intelligent political responses to what Israel should do in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. Perfectly legitimate. But the problem we face is that how do we combat the fact that when you feel that a group of people want you dead and that peace and reconciliation are not possible, after 16 years, you stop yearning for peace, you stop believing that it's a reality, and you also stop feeling that that person over there is somebody who who is an end and not a means, who obligates you. One of the most difficult things, 65% of Israeli society believe that Sergeant Azaria shouldn't even be tried. Sergeant Azaria is the soldier in Hebron, who 11 minutes after the attack occurred, saw the wounded terrorist moving and killed him. And um, now we don't know, why did he shoot him? Do I know why he shot him? I saw a video, does the video look? Is anybody here for trying people on the basis of a video? For that we have what? A court, let a court investigate. 65% of Israeli society was, even, was against trying him. Now why should we be against trying him? Why? Is it okay by definition? The Israeli code of ethics is founded on the principle, and I had this very, I was just in Dallas a few weeks ago, and one of the kosher, anybody here from Dallas? Okay, we have to work on that. <laughs> um, one of the kosher restaurants in Dallas is right next to an army recruiting, recruiting office, and it centers something, and there's this line of, of, the code, of, of, of the code. The code is bravery, the code is this, there's a whole code. It's a whole code. Kept, I was very cold in my soul from that cold. It's a very complicated code. The Israeli code of ethics, I'm not saying we're doing this, the Israeli code of ethics starts with the principle in that all human beings have a right to life. It's in the military code of ethic, which creates, obligates the notion that when you go to war, war is not a place, and this is what's complicated about war, war is the place where you are allowed to kill. That's, War is that zone where it's not morally, at least unless you're a pacifist, in which it's not morally forbidden to murder. And therefore, how you fight a war is of critical significance. And therefore the code of ethics says that you will only use your weapon in self-defense. You will only do so in proportion to the danger that you face. And you will do everything in your power to avoid either civilian casualties or casualties to prisoners of war. This is in our code of ethic. 65% felt that we can murder him. For 11 minutes, he was lying on the floor, bleeding, and no one offered him medical assistance. Imagine a reverse video of an Israeli soldier being captured in Gaza, lying wounded and bleeding to death. What would we say? So if you ask me the question, and I'll put it in, in, in terms that, that I feel a little more comfortable, but I don't know, if, and I'll try to answer. Do I believe that the power post-67, do I believe that the fantasy of the Temple Mount is in our hands? Do I believe that the fear 
that is engulfing so much of our society can unleash forces of evil within our society and is unleashing them absolutely and unequivocally. And our ch question now is, how do we deal with that? When people, however, and this is part of, of a challenge of all of us, if people think that you are belittling their fear, you become irrelevant. You actually don't become irrelevant, you become dangerous. Because if somebody is endangering me and you're belittling the fear, you're actually a greater source of danger to me. Because you're telling me everything is fine when in fact they want to kill me. How do we respect the complex reality of the Middle East and still engage in moral reflection and moral criticism and moral aspirations is, that's the story. And are we always doing it right? No. I think part of what's been moving in Israeli society over the last 10 years has nothing to do with security. Security, easy. I could tell you I am for a two-state solution and I don't know how to implement it right now. I don't know, I believe that implementing a short-term, a two-state solution in the short run will be suicide for the state of Israel. I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying I believe. I want a two-state solution. Nothing to do with what we should do on how quickly we should move. There is a moral shift taking place. And that moral shift is aligning itself sometimes with a political position which it has nothing to do with. Benny Begin and Ruby Rivlin are one statists of the most extreme form. Yet their moral conversation and their moral principles about what does it mean to be a Jew and how we treat others is, is, is uncompromising. It's one of the reasons why I believe that the way we're going to heal Israeli society is that we have to start working on the way we treat Israeli Arab, Palestinians, and refugees. How, are we, how do we treat the non-Jews here who are not a security risk? We have to reactivate that core Jewish instinct of moral responsibility to others. And precisely those others who aren't threatening us, because those who threaten you, that what you call the Nazi, that experience of being attacked by people who want you dead. That's why Israelis speak so often. It's not just politics. I know it's political stuff and manipulation, but it's not just politics when, when if you kill us, if you kill a Jew, or you try to kill a Jew, you're going to get a reward. There's something obscene for Israelis in that. Something obscene. One second. You killed what? You killed somebody. Now you're going to make a salary more than anything you could have ever made. I'm supposed to make peace with you. There's something obscene about that. And there's something coherent saying, excuse me, if you don't stop that, a plague on all your houses. So part of what's happened is Israelis see it and they feel it. And the remarkable thing that all of us know is how little, a little amount of fear is needed to completely shut down your moral compassion. Well, we don't have a little amount of fear, we have a lot amount of fear. And uh, part of living in the city of God, part of living, part of the challenge of Zionism is how do we overcome the question? Not frightened by the question you ask, not frightened by the, by the challenge it places before us, but to recognize that every single one of us I don't care whether you're politically right-wing or you're politically left-wing. I don't care whether you think Abu Mazen will never make peace or you think he's the perfect peace partner to ever come down on the face of the earth. Makes no difference to me. Makes no difference. There are certain moral principles that have to define a Jewish state. And we have to look at all those places that are moving us away. Har Habayit Biadenu is one of them. The Jerusalem of loss is another. And there are many... Also, the new power we have. Arrogance is a third. Um, we have to do much, 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 much better. And I hope we will. And it, our time is up. Um, thank you very, very much.